YouTubers, Tamashi here. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. As a human who was assigned female at birth, I've been fascinated with games for girls ever since I was first exposed to them at a young age. What do I mean by for girls? Well, I'm talking about games developed with a female demographic in mind, and marketed exclusively for that demographic. The existence of games solely designed to be played by girls isn't inherently a bad thing, it's better than excluding them from the industry altogether, but it can send a confusing message. As a kid, I thought to myself, where are all the games labeled boy games? If there are only some games labeled girl, and the majority of games aren't labeled that way, does that mean I'm only allowed to play these few games? If the only games that are labeled girl are low quality and ridden with stereotypes, does that mean I'm not taken seriously by the gaming industry and shouldn't play games at all? Ultimately, these games push me further away rather than drawing me in as they were intended to do, and the irony in that has amused me ever since. But, ever the optimist, I'd like to think that the industry has learned from its failures with my generation, and the games for girls today send a more welcoming and positive message to their target audience. And today, that's what we're going to figure out. Taking the best-selling series of games for girls from my generation, say any games released from 1995 to 2005, and comparing them to the top-selling game series of the new generation, or any games released after 2006, we'll find out if the industry has made any progress at appealing to young female gamers. We'll examine only the top sellers of each generation, just to get an accurate picture of what the majority of girls would have played during each time period, regardless of their quality. I hope to find that games for girls these days exist in more variety, higher quality, and higher volume than those that existed during my generation, and that this video will show the real progress the industry has made towards diversifying its audience. First, let's start by clarifying what qualifies in my book as a game for girls, or GFG for short. To me, a GFG is any game that is marketed exclusively to girls and not a general audience. This will be pretty easy to determine, since most of the games that qualify will actually label themselves as for girls, either on the box or in the game somewhere. Going by this definition, this means most games that are actually popular with female gamers, such as Animal Crossing and Kingdom Hearts, or games that feature female protagonists like Tomb Raider, don't count as GFGs because they're marketed to general audiences. I'm also going to narrow this down to games that were released on dedicated gaming platforms, and not PC or mobile games. PCs and cell phones are more common household objects, and a girl wouldn't necessarily need to commit to buying a system just to play games, so typically games for these platforms don't need to try as hard to reach a female audience. Lastly, as an American, I will only be talking about games that were released in the US. Different countries have different gender dynamics and different gaming markets, so to narrow the scope of this video, I'm going to focus only on my home market. A GFG may be developed in another country, but only the localized US version will count for this video. But why even make games marketed exclusively to girls in the first place, one might wonder. After all, there's nothing about video games that really requires the player to be one gender or the other, and girls don't necessarily need to be catered to to enjoy games. Well, for reasons so complex I would need to make a separate video to fully explain them, when video games were first introduced in the US, gaming was seen as an almost exclusively male activity. There were, of course, always girls playing games from the beginning, but the overwhelming majority of the consumer base was male for decades. Game publishers knew they could double sales if they could just get more girls to start buying games as well, so they began doing market research to figure out new ways to reach female players. Through this endeavor, they discovered that girls generally preferred different characteristics and activities in the games they played compared to boys, which meant that if gaming companies wanted to dramatically diversify their consumer base, they would need to cater directly to the audience they were attempting to attract. So they began developing games just for girls, in the hopes that if girls enjoyed these games designed specifically for them, that they might start buying more video games in general. The idea was that GFGs would act as a gateway game, reeling girls into the industry and keeping them there to buy and consume gaming products as regular customers. Back in the day, most GFGs released between the years of 1995 and 2005 were tie-ins to TV shows or pre-existing lines of toys. Brand name recognition was an easy way to get kids and parents alike to pick out games based on the value of the IP alone, without knowing anything about the game itself, so it was a popular strategy for marketing games. As for how many games girls had to pick from, though I can't find figures for the exact number of qualifying games released in this time period, GFGs were a very small fraction of the total games on the market. Just to demonstrate, the Game Boy Color, the console with the most GFG ridden library of its time, only had GFGs take up a mere 5% of the total games released for it. During this era, there were two dominating brands of GFG, Barbie and Mary Kate and Ashley. Barbie was a pioneer for GFGs, beginning her foray into the video game market back in the 80s on the Commodore 64, a home computer system. Mattel, being in the toy industry, probably saw the potential of selling games to girls sooner than most, and got right to work hiring developers to make games for dedicated video game consoles. Early efforts showed promise, and the brand soon expanded onto the NES, Game Boy, and Sega Genesis in the early 90s. By the mid-90s, she had a solid resume of about 7 games, and was even the first to explicitly label her games as GFGs. Her first Game Boy entry was called Barbie Game Girl, because damn, was calling your console the Game Boy not an easy way to confuse parents. 
At the time, Barbie dolls were most popular with girls aged 3 to 5, so most Barbie products were aimed very young, and her games were no exception. Between the years of 1995 and 2005, Barbie released 17 games on designated video game systems. That may seem like a lot of games, but most were released as portable or console versions of PC titles, and were not original. Barbie may have been one of the first to make GFGs on dedicated systems, but she wasn't about to put all of her eggs in one basket. Most of the development work went into the PC titles, and then trickled down to everything else, designating the smallest amount of budget and effort to the console and handheld ports. To make this process easier for developers, most games recycled assets from their PC counterparts, and 8 of the 17 games ended up being low-quality minigame collections. Minigames are cheap and easy to develop, as often developers can get away with cloning an old arcade or carnival game and recycling the same few minigames with different coats of paint for different collections. Minigames also don't require a lot of commitment from the player. They tend to have a short duration, which makes the game collection easy to pick up and put down at any time, perfect for the presumed casual first-time gamer. The low cost to develop and low required commitment from the player has made minigame collections a staple of GFGs. Take Barbie's Ocean Discovery for example. Released in 1999 on the Game Boy Color, but was first released in 1998 as a PC game as a tie into the 1996 Ocean Friends line of dolls. The PC version of the game was originally a minigames collection, which translates well to the Game Boy Color, as all that really needed to be watered down, no pun intended, were the graphics and story in order for it to work as a handheld title. Here you play as Barbie swimming around a hub world, finding and playing minigames. For beating a minigame, you're rewarded with an item to allow you to progress through the hub world and unlock the next set of minigames. There are about a dozen or so minigames in total, and though the game isn't bad looking for a Game Boy Color title, it's really pretty boring. There's no challenge since you can't actually lose any of the games. They're extremely simple to begin with, and it recycles the most basic and well-known games in history. There's a Simon knockoff, a picture scramble puzzle, a couple mazes, some carnival games, you get the idea. While the PC game had a bit more depth, the Game Boy version has very little to offer, and it can be beaten in about 10 minutes. There's nothing here to hook players in and make them think, this video game stuff is fun, I want to play more of this, meaning it fails as a gateway into the industry. Minigame collections are not the only popular genre among GFGs. Of the remaining 9 Barbie games from this era that were not minigame collections, 4 were related to horseback riding or animal care. Though there's no consensus as to why this phenomenon occurs, girls, especially young girls, as a group tend to have a strong like for horses. This isn't universal, but it's prevalent enough that many scientific studies have been done to try to uncover the link between girls and horses. Some scientists theorize that horses represent a power fantasy for young girls, and especially for kids who tend to have little to no control over their own lives, taming and riding a powerful creature is an exercise in taking back some control. Horses are also animals, and studies have shown that girls tend to develop a desire to nurture and care for animals and children at a young age. Horses fulfill these two major roles for young girls, and have been popular with them for a very long time. Because of this, making a riding simulator seems to be an easy way to appeal to young girls, since there are really only two major things this sort of game might require. First, allow players to care for their animal, and second, allow them to ride it. Throw some customization options in, and that's the bare minimum you can get away with, making it a difficult type of game to screw up. Barbie Race and Ride, released in 1999 for the PlayStation 1, aimed no higher than that minimum. The game is a straight port of the PC title of the same name, just with 90% more loading screens. Here you get to choose a horse, pick a name for it from a list of voice acted horse names, and pick an outfit for Barbie to wear from two options. Then you get to go to the stable, where you have the option of hopping straight on the track, or taking the time to feed and bathe your horse, an activity that serves no mechanical function but still contributes to the role-playing experience. From the bulletin board menu, you can select one of four tracks to ride. These are pre-rendered 3D courses, which you ride on rails from a first-person point of view. You can slow down or speed up, which just changes the speed at which the cinematic plays, or move your horse left and right, which doesn't change the direction of the horse, but rather scoots it slightly to either side of the straight path. You can also jump occasionally if there's an obstacle on the track. Along each course are a number of superfluous distractions that range from pointless animations to unoriginal minigames. Once per course, you get the option of entering either a race or an obstacle course, which is really the only time there's any real gameplay involved. All in all, this game is alright, but it's not really an involved experience, and it clearly worked better as a PC point-and-click kind of game for young kids. Like most Barbie games, it doesn't have a lot to offer anyone over the age of 6, and it was so lazily ported that the format barely works with PlayStation inputs. As a brand, Barbie is a fashion doll first and foremost, so it's no surprise that fashion is a common theme in her games. In most titles, regardless of the subject matter, there's some level of dress-up involved. Take the 1999 game Barbie Super Sports for the PlayStation 1, which was also a console version of a PC game of the same name. This is an interesting example, because it's possibly the only GFG in this era to tackle sports, for which I'd give it points in the variety department, except I'd immediately have to take them back because there are only two sports to pick from, inline skating and snowboarding. Before you begin either activity, you get to go shopping for gear to dress your doll of choice in. 
Considering Barbie's background, I don't have an issue with this. It's fair to assume that if a young girl is interested in Barbie, she'd be interested in clothes. My issue, rather, is that it demonstrates a lack of understanding about what's enjoyable about fashion. There's almost nothing to pick from, and there's no way to mix and match because only light-colored items go together at all, which doesn't encourage creativity or expression from the player. With fashion being a common theme in most GFGs, not just Barbie, more often than not this is a problem. Because these games are often created by people who don't care or know anything about the subject matter, they don't know what girls would actually like to dress up in, or why they would enjoy fashion in the first place. But this isn't just about customizing an avatar. In Super Sports, every time you shop for gear, you get all these voice clips from Barbie emphasizing how fun it is to go shopping. So little effort went into the selection of clothes itself, and shopping is such a long process at the start of the game that it seems like the act of shopping is the focus here rather than the clothes, which gives me the impression this feature was included more to encourage girls to buy more dolls and more clothes for dolls rather than any genuine attempt to connect to their interests. Compound this with the overall low quality of the game, and it comes across as cheap and exploitative, sending a negative message. All in all, the Barbie games, while they may have been the first to target a young female demographic, were boring at best and lazy at worst. They lacked depth, and failed to demonstrate any real understanding of what made games enjoyable to their audience. Released at around the same time, the Mary-Kate and Ashley games came as almost a response to the games Barbie was putting out. The Olsen twins were pioneers of their own market, the first to cater to the wants and needs of tween-age girls, and their company Dual Star made sure to label all of its products accordingly. Real Clothes for Real Girls is the name of their clothing line, Real Books for Real Girls is the name of their book line, and Real Games for Real Girls is the name of their video game line, as opposed to those fake girl games Barbie was putting out. Living up to this bold claim, the girls were actually involved in the creation of their games, and while it's not known to what extent, their influence is evident. Almost every single one of their games had Mary-Kate and Ashley doing voiceover work, even when it was completely unnecessary. And unlike other brands of GFG, their games had at least some insight on what was popular with girls. After all, Dual Star was one of the few companies making media for young girls with a built-in focus group. Take, for example, their answer to the horse game, Winter Circle, released in 2001 on the PlayStation and Game Boy Color. The girls, especially Mary-Kate, actually rode horses as a hobby, and likely had a lot of input during the development of this game. The PlayStation version begins with allowing you to customize, name, and groom your horse, which here not only serves a role-playing function, but is mechanically integrated into the game as well, because one of the events is dressage, where one of the things you're graded on is how well your horse is groomed. Once you set up your horse and rider, you can select one of many modes to play in, from the aforementioned dressage, to racing, to obstacle horses, to a free-roaming mode on a variety of huge maps. As you play events, you earn ribbons which you can spend on clothes for your character. This is actually one of the things that the Mary-Kate and Ashley games did quite well. The twins' personal stylist, Judy Schwartz, was responsible for choosing clothes for their games, and always included enough colors and styles to allow players to mix and match and express themselves. The people who worked on this game got what was enjoyable about fashion and horses, and since the wide variety of clothes and extensive customization options were what they put the most effort into, it's clear that the clothes are the focus here, not the act of purchasing them. Though this game definitely had its problems, like its graphics and the occasional clunkiness of its controls, it shows that having the girls involved in the making of the game paid off. Unfortunately, that's about where the list of good things about their games ends. Though the Mary-Kate and Ashley brand may have been progressive in that it was the first to attempt to target the tween market, it wasn't especially progressive in any other way. Being one of the first in an otherwise untapped market, Mary-Kate and Ashley's videos and TV shows tended to rely heavily on stereotypes and exaggerated gender differences in order to relate to young girls, to an extent that even the Olsons themselves were uncomfortable with at times. As children, this manifested itself in Ashley always playing the stereotypical girly girl, and Mary-Kate always playing the tomboy. As they got older, though, it manifested itself in their characters obsessing over boys, clothes, popularity, and other superficial things. Because the Mary-Kate and Ashley brand as a whole was so heavily steeped in reinforcing gender stereotypes, it came through in their other products as well, including their video games. Take Crush Course, for example. Released on PC, PlayStation, and Game Boy Color in 2001, the PC and PlayStation versions were a minigame collection developed by Endspace. Crush Course borrows themes from the videos the twins were putting out at the time, including a catty, jealous rivalry with a popular girl in school, and the entire game game revolving around boys. In this game, Mary-Kate and Ashley receive a single love letter from two different boys, and the token evil popular girl gets to it before they do and rips it to shreds, scattering pieces of it around the school. Honestly, if I were them, I'd find it a little insulting that I got lumped in with my sister in a love note, but the two of them find it flattering enough to go after the pieces, playing an assortment of, you guessed it, mini-games to earn them back. The Crush Course is probably the best-looking Mary-Kate and Ashley game on the PlayStation, as it opts for a more cartoony style rather than the creepy polygonal realism of their other games. It's also the laziest. 
and Space decided not to bother developing new minigames for this title, and just recycled ones from their previous games, including Rugrats Search for Reptar, Rugrats Studio Tour, and even another Mary Kay Nash game, Magical Mystery Mall. Combine this with N-Space's notoriously bad controls, and this title was undoubtedly one of Mary Kate and Ashley's worst. While Winter Circle may have genuinely tried to understand its subject matter, in Crush Course, the lack of effort is apparent, and combined with its reliance on shallow stereotypes, it's clear that the people who made this game didn't actually care about or understand their audience at all. As mentioned before though, both Crush Course and Winter Circle were released on the Game Boy Color as well. The majority of all GFGs get released on handheld systems, due to a number of factors, such as development costs and again low required commitment from the player. Handhelds are portable, so they don't require the player to invest a lot of time in one sitting, and they're more likely to be played in situations where there'd be fewer things vying for the player's attention, such as car rides or waiting rooms. So naturally, of the four console games Mary Kate and Ashley released, three got an accompanying handheld release of the same name, but often these had nothing in common with their console counterparts. Take Sweet 16 License to Drive, for example. Released in 2002, this was a partial tie-in to two different Mary-Kate and Ashley properties, both their movie Getting There, which is about the girls getting their driver's licenses, and their animated series Mary-Kate and Ashley in Action, which the art style of the game was taken from. The handheld version is a crazy taxi clone, and while it has some glaring flaws on a gameplay level, it's a decent and somewhat entertaining experience. It may not be a completely original idea, but it at least adapts the source material on a mechanical level, and offers a lengthy and challenging experience to its players. The console version, however, was a completely different game in a completely different genre. The first few Mary-Kate and Ashley games were released on the PlayStation, a console that had already proven to be popular among young girls. But Sweet 16 came out right at the start of a new console generation, so neither the PlayStation 2 nor the GameCube offered the same kind of player base. Faced with this lack of security, Acclaim decided to make the console version of Sweet 16 a party game. Party games for girls often operate under the assumption that perhaps someone else in the immediate family bought the console, and that a girl would only be interested in playing it on occasion in a social context. This makes the genre a safer bet when marketing to girls, because it treats the console as a household commodity rather than a commitment. So rather than designing the game around driving as a mechanic, the console version of Sweet 16 didn't bother to adapt the source material, and relegated the driving aspect to a superficial stylistic choice for the sake of an easier to market concept and the end result is just kind of boring and contrived. It's not that either game is terrible, it's just that the single-player Game Boy Advance game clearly works better than the forced multiplayer experience of the console versions. The game may not have sold as many copies if it were similar to the Game Boy Advance version, but the copies it did sell would have left a better impression on the audience, working better as a gateway game. Additionally, party games contextualize play as a purely social experience, reinforcing the console as something a girl wouldn't want to play on her own. Releasing a party game on console because girls don't buy consoles is not going to help convince girls to buy more consoles. Overall, the Barbie and Mary-Kate and Ashley games missed the mark when it came to appealing to young girls, and served as an important demonstration of what doesn't work when trying to market games to girls. GFGs from this era refused to engage their audience directly by understanding their wants and needs, and girls were saddled with nothing but low-budget titles and minigame collections permeated in stereotypes. And what about GFGs today? Do they still have the same issues, or do they improve upon reaching out to young girls compared to their predecessors? Let's take a look and find out. Keep in mind, to demonstrate progress in the industry, we're not looking for good or even decent games. We just need them to be better than the games in the previous generation. These days, in the post-2005 era of gaming, GFGs are developed in much higher volume, giving girls more to pick from. 10% of the Nintendo DS library, the most GFG-ridden library to date, is made up of GFGs. That's double the amount of GFGs on the market compared to the percentage of Game Boy Color games that were GFGs. We're also seeing an increase in GFG titles that are not based on existing licensed properties, like TV shows or toy lines, which shows that gaming companies aren't relying on brand name recognition to sell games, but instead letting the games stand on their own and marketing them based on content. Developers have more faith that girls will buy games in the first place, and they know they have to try harder to make quality content to keep girls coming back for more. In the past 10 years, the GFG market has been dominated by different names, Cooking Mama and the Imagine series. Interestingly, Barbie is still making games to this day, but because the brand's relevance has waned with time and competition, her newer games are no longer top sellers. Cooking Mama is noteworthy because it's a rare example of a GFG that people outside the target demographic actually tend to enjoy. When it was first released in 2006, right away it started generating buzz. IGN picked it as their standout game of E3 that year, and it even garnered enough popularity to warrant a PETA Flash parody. But what made it stand out so much? Developed by a Japanese studio, Office Create, this game is known here as a rare example of a GFG that's actually good, but it's not so novel in its home country. 
In Japan, video games were never seen as strictly a boy thing the way they were here, so games for girls have had better treatment. Over there, the words girl game aren't synonymous with bad game the way they are in most parts of the world, because Japanese girls have been part of the core game buying demographic from the get-go. As such, their GFGs receive bigger budgets and more care than they would in other markets. Only recently has the US industry realized that localizing the treasure trove of Japanese GFGs would be a cheap and easy way to get quality GFGs onto the US market. And so, the international smash hit Cooking Mama series was born, holding not the distinction of doing anything really unique or groundbreaking, but instead just being the first localized GFG series with an actual budget. Really, that's the only reason I can think of that the series stood out at all, because otherwise, it does nothing GFGs haven't done for decades. The Mama games are essentially minigames collections, with each minigame tying back into their respective task, whether it be cooking, gardening, crafting, camping, or childcare. In any given Mama game, the main goal is to cook a dish or plant a flower or rear a child by completing a series of short minigames, and the success of your endeavor is based on how well you do. Make no mistake, this is not a simulation series. No one plucks stems from fruit like this, or skewers shrimp like this. It's simply yet another minigame collection, with some side effectual home economics lessons. The only distinction is that unlike most GFGs, most of these minigames are original, or at least disguised well enough that you wouldn't realize you've played them before in other games. And with Mama's bigger budget than most other minigame collection GFGs, they also get a much bigger selection of games per title. Every step in every dish gets its own unique minigame, and there are a wide variety of side games outside the main task to boot. The more you cook dishes, the more side games and other dishes you unlock, which gives the game a sense of progression, and with so very many different games in each title, it doesn't get monotonous or boring. The Cooking Mama games are certainly better designed, and much more polished than GFG minigame collections of yore, so it's not surprising that they had some mainstream success, even if they don't really break any new ground outside of just doing what everyone else does only better. Considering Cooking Mama is a Japanese series, it's fitting that her series and its spin-offs entirely revolve around traditionally feminine roles, with home economics being at the heart of every game. In Japanese society, harmony is valued above all else, and everyone is encouraged to play their role for the good of the whole. This includes gender roles, meaning the traditional gender roles are actually encouraged and reinforced in Japan. The first few games about cooking didn't cause too much of a stir, but once they started releasing spin-offs focused only on traditionally feminine roles, including Babysitting Mama, which came with a big plush baby doll, it was clear that the series was built for this value system and it caused some controversy in local markets where reinforcing gender roles is frowned upon. The series never really recovered from this, and the Mama games, despite the newer titles being basically unchanged as far as content goes, haven't enjoyed the same success in the past few years as they did in 2006. While localizing Japanese games with bigger budgets might be a shortcut for getting quality GFGs on American shelves, these games will always be products of their culture, for better or worse. Controversial gender politics aside though, the Mama games made important strides for GFGs. No other GFG has ever broken through to the mainstream the way Cooking Mama did, and even if it couldn't keep the momentum going, it demonstrated to the public that games for girls aren't necessarily bad games by nature. It definitely raised the bar as far as girls' expectations for the industry goes, and it's not likely the Imagine series would even exist if Cooking Mama didn't break down these barriers first. Ubisoft created the Imagine series of games in 2007 to ride on the coattails of Cooking Mama's success. I don't think it was a coincidence that the first game in the Imagine line was Imagine MasterChef. Well, I say they created the Imagine series, but only because without the Imagine umbrella, these games don't actually have much in common at all aside from target demographic. Of the 30 and counting games in the Imagine line, most are developed by different studios, and they all tend to vary dramatically in quality, format, and even genre from game to game, so it's not a series of games so much as a curated collection. Ubisoft did do a good job of putting together a line of games that cover a wide variety of interests, however. Our GFGs of the past tended not to stray from the tried and true or just plain stereotypically girly interests, these cover a huge range of roles for girls to play, from journalist to interior designer to teacher to doctor to veterinarian. Yes, they still tend to stay within traditionally feminine careers, so they're not blowing down the doors of progress or anything, but they're still much more diverse than any other series of GFG yet. Although Ubisoft classifies the Imagine series as simulation games, I found that's not really true of most titles. Genres in the series range from minigame collections to rhythm games to creative tools and more. Take Imagine Detective, for example, one of the few Imagine games actually developed by one of Ubisoft's branches, rather than a third-party developer. This is a puzzle game that begins with a stylish graphic novel-inspired intro, where we meet our protagonist Kirsten Spark and her wisecracking talking cat sidekick Ozzy. We learn a lot about Kirsten, including that her parents are divorced and that her penchant for solving mysteries is fueled by the death of her father years ago during an explosion. Already you can tell this isn't your average budget title. So much effort is put into developing Kirsten as a character, from her backstory to the way she talks to her willingness to break the rules in order to bring about justice, that she really stands out, not only as a developed character in a GFG, but also as a well-defined protagonist. And as a protagonist in a kid's game, Kirsten does a lot of decidedly not role model things, 
like getting into fist fights with grown men, skipping class, breaking into people's apartments, sneaking into crime scenes, and she dispenses justice based on her own moral compass, ignoring the crimes of those who she deems good people and punishing those she considers bad. But questionable vigilantism aside, she's a smart, sassy girl with lots of personality for girls to relate to and live out their crime-fighting fantasies through. Compared to GFGs of the past, taking the time to set up characters and build a world for them to the extent that an imagined detective does is unprecedented, and it feels like a game crafted as a labor of love by those who created it, not just a mandate from their publisher to make something girly. Certainly this game has its problems too though, as it takes place in a city built on indigenous people's land, repeatedly refers to the natives as Indians, and exploits this backdrop to infuse more mystery into the world and set up Indiana Jones-esque settings for Kirsten to adventure through. The gameplay itself isn't especially noteworthy either, as telling a story took priority during development, and the puzzles seem to be almost an afterthought. But even if it has problematic elements, the passion that went into creating this game shows through, and if only for that alone, I feel like it's a step in the right direction. Imagine Detective is a rare case, however, as the majority of Imagine titles are not developed by Ubisoft itself and instead developed by contracted companies or are localized versions of games released in other regions under different names. For example, take Imagine Ballet Star and Imagine Ice Champions, two localized versions of Japanese games in a series called Kudo Kudo Princess, developed by Spike. Once again, these aren't sports simulators, but rather visual novel-style adventure games with an emphasis on story and some deeper stat-based mechanics. And Imagine Ballet Star, throughout the course of each day you can play minigames to raise your various stats, like balance, relationship with your dance partner, and so on. Though these minigames mostly don't have anything to do with ballet, they are at least related to their specific stat, and the better you do with these minigames, the easier the main ballet portions of the game will be. The same goes for Imagine Ice Champions, only here instead of raising your stats by playing unrelated minigames, the main rhythm-based ice routines become easier the more you participate in practices, keeping the focus wholly on figure skating. What stands out about these titles compared to GFGs of the past is not only the level of polish, both games are fully voice acted, but also the level of engagement with the source material. In Ballet Star, for example, you can find real-world relevant information about ballet in the player's bedroom, including how to do certain stretches and dance moves, and it even includes some ballet history and information on different productions. This shows that the developers took their audience and their interests very seriously. While GFTs of the past might have only offered a shallow understanding of their topics and what made them enjoyable, Imagine Ballet Star and Ice Champions go above and beyond to demonstrate not only that they understand their subjects, but that they care about them as well. Although the majority of Imagine games may not be simulations, there are still a rare few that could be considered as such. Like Imagine Zookeeper, developed by French studio Magic Pockets. Like most Imagine titles, it does have adventure elements where there's still some story involved but here it takes a backseat to the simulation aspects. The title is pretty misleading, as it has nothing to do with zoos at all. Instead, you play as Emily, who just began her job working on an animal reserve. The goal here is to run your reserve efficiently, providing enough water, shelter, and energy to your animal enclosures to keep them healthy. All the while, you go out on missions to rescue sick or injured animals and take tally of local wildlife. In terms of simulating the actual functions of an animal reserve, the mechanics mostly stay surface level, but the systems themselves have quite a bit of depth placing the emphasis on managing resources and monitoring the health of each animal. In this way, it works similarly to SimCity, only instead of managing industrial and residential areas, you're keeping animals healthy by making sure they have enough energy, food, and shelter. What's noteworthy about this game compared to GFGs of the past with similar subject matter is that this game doesn't really have any sort of nurturing aspect. Aside from petting the animals to befriend them to allow you to take them out of their habitats, you don't groom them or physically feed them or interact with them much inside their pens. The animals are still wild, after all, so to do so would break from the simulation. Instead, the game relies on the depth of its systems to engage the audience without outright pandering to them, and it respects its audience enough to have faith that they'll actually enjoy the game based on its own merit. I think overall, this approach sets up better expectations for girls in the industry as a gateway game, since it doesn't use its subject matter as a crutch and demonstrates the games can be fun regardless of the topic. With over 30 Imagine titles out there, it's difficult to provide a cohesive picture of the series as a whole. While there may be some standout quality titles, there are just as many titles that are simply middle of the road, and some that are even shockingly bad. Pretending the examples I used are indicative of the quality of the series as a whole would be misrepresenting it, but there are too many games to cover all of them. Ultimately, this is the downside of lumping so many dramatically different games created by dramatically different studios into the same collection. It creates a misconception that the games are similar, so one bad game can color the reputation of the entire series. It hides the gems among the mediocre and the bad, making it hard to know what you're picking up until you've played it. Still, the Imagine series fills a huge void in the GFD market. Offering a wide variety of topics and playstyles and releasing titles in huge volume, it provides more options for girls to pick from, some even good. Now that we've taken a look at roughly 20 years worth of GFGs, it's time for the moment of truth. Has the gaming industry made any progress in reaching out to a female demographic? Overwhelmingly, the answer is yes. 
Though low budget tie-ins to existing brands and crappy minigame collections may still make up a portion of the GFG market, the size of the market itself and the number of quality games out there now for girls to pick from has greatly improved. In the past, the majority of GFGs out there were shallow and lazy and pervaded by stereotypes. They were unoriginal cheap cash grabs that failed to offer girls anything entertaining or demonstrate any real understanding of what made their interests enjoyable. GFGs today are crafted with more care and show a deeper level of engagement with their topics and audience. Not only do they cover a wider variety of interests, but they take the time to really understand what makes a certain type of game or a certain topic fun. We're even starting to see GFGs that don't just strive to be good girl games, but good games in their own right and the market is growing out of the bad game ghetto it once was. So you might be wondering, why does any of this matter? They're just games for little girls. What impact can they really have on the industry as a whole? Well, even if these days the average age of most gamers is between 18 and 35, the majority of gamers start playing at a young age. According to a study by the Kaiser Family Foundation, most kids start playing video games between the ages of 2 and 7 years old, and the peak in gaming activity tends to occur between 8 and 13 years old. If publishers want to make customers for life, targeting a demographic when they're young is a good way to do it. So GFGs are a crucial part of diversifying the industry. These might just be games for little girls, but the girls that play them will grow up into the next generation of consumers. And the progress the GFG market has made over the past 10 years means girls will have more positive expectations for games in general moving forward. Since gaming companies want girls' money, their products will need to try and meet these expectations, which means there will be a shift in how women are treated by the industry as a whole. These little girl games have the potential to affect the future of gaming, so it's important to give them serious consideration. I just hope gaming companies continue to treat them with the care and respect they deserve. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to click here to subscribe for more. See ya!